Hello, once again, let's talk about media and communication. And we will explore today uh, how countries use branding to justify their foreign policies, well, particularly when we're dealing with uh, human rights issues. Okay, And so I invited uh, Isabel Carlson. Uh, Isabel will tell us about how Sweden promotes feminism in its foreign policy and how the country uses this branding uh, to frame its actions as positive activism, to position itself as an authority, to gain public support. So we'll jump uh, into those issues. Isabel, welcome to our episode. Thank you very much for having me. Isabel, you mentioned in the article uh, that scholars primarily view foreign policy communication as a tool for projecting narratives or extending existing foreign policies. But the concept of branding a country's foreign policy, that is still under research. Am I correct? Yes, I think so. Um, I mean, we can see that this concept or this phrase of branding a foreign policy is used um, sometimes in the literature, but um, to my best knowledge, nobody has really looked into it. And I mean, the thing is, we, we see that countries do it. They do what I would call branding their foreign policy. So I was really curious to, to look into um, how do they do that? How can we understand this concept? Why do countries do that? Um, so to, yeah, to, to start exploring the mechanisms thereof, uh, which you, I did with this paper. Mm -hmm. You focused your study uh, on Sweden, um, uh, human rights. Uh, so let us know the main, main findings, the main highlights of your study. Mm -hmm. So um, the reason I looked at Sweden was that uh, Sweden had from 2014 to 2022 a so-called feminist foreign policy. And, and this has been mentioned by um, other scholars um, um, as yeah a policy that has been branded as feminist. So um, the, when I when I took this uh, branding perspective and then I used um, more specifically a lens of legitimation to understand how this branding is um, yeah constructed, I found that um, because you could say that we are in a time of attention economy also in international relations, you have to stand out out as a country, especially as a small country like Sweden. Um, you also kind of have to sell your foreign policy to to make it appeal to to publics abroad um mainly also at home of course but to um yeah raise your voice and, and become recognizable for something um so yeah i, I really thought it, it it seemed to me a lot like like this is also about selling your foreign policy approach and in the particular case of sweden then as you already mentioned um i found mainly three ways in which this feminist foreign policy then is um, this branding is legitimated and that is uh, first by um, really uh, emphasizing the goodness of this policy to say okay yes this is activism but it's a good form of activism the second um, way this policy is legitimated is by um, by Sweden to really claim a position as an expert we are really good at gender equality issues. We have been that for a long time. So that's why it's only a very good idea that we do this, so to say. <laughs> um, and, and the third way that this policy of branding is legitimated is then by um, yeah, explaining, uh, illustrating how it fits into like broader global um, efforts and attempts and, and discourses of, of human rights promotion. It's uh, it's perfect. And who do you think, uh, who can learn from this from this study from these conclusions? And what are the lessons in your opinion in practice? Mm. Um, I mean, of of course, I, I hope that um, uh, nation branding and, and public diplomacy and, and these kinds of uh, fields of international communication can learn from it as well as um, international relations research. But more for the practical. Um, a perspective I really hope that yeah people working um at, at institutions such as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or maybe these institutions that promote more the cultural side of a country and not only in Sweden but but around the world where yeah where one is interested in, in yeah standing out this way but also policymakers that they 
maybe are inspired to 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 think um through like with this lens of branding about uh, foreign policy issues and then on on the one side i think um it it can inspire to really yeah think about what such a branding enables so so you 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 enable a perhaps also a small country to have a voice to stand out to um mark a standpoint that you take but but on the a more risky side, of course, you create expectations, uh, which is not a bad thing, but but you do, and um, you you will probably also receive headwind because you you stand out more and um, um, you you might be put more into scrutiny. So so I think um, seeing this as branding helps to be prepared for for these kind of challenges. Perfect. Let's follow up on this a bit. Uh, so. Um... As we said in the beginning, this is a little bit still understudied. So should future research focus on market studies, uh, but perhaps um, also analyzing the impact of the success of these branding stories in the long run? So what's ahead of us in terms of research? I mean, I think um, we should use this as long as it helps us. Um, I mean, the, the the reason I was interested in, in taking this perspective in first place was because I, I thought, I, I think we can really... Um, it's, it's a very it's a useful concept in um, or a useful perspective for understanding what's going on there. So as long as it helps us, we should uh, continue using this. And and I think, like you said, it would be very interesting to look at the um, yeah what what, what continue like what happens with 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 foreign policy at the later stage in communication because I really focused on this this very early stage uh, very early point in communication so the policy is there um it has been decided that this will be there how how is it legitimated and of course there's so many more um elements in communication that we could look at so that would be like you said the, the consequences or the impacts but i think it would also be very interesting to look how is this taken up by by publics how it is debated uh, how it's contested um perhaps how it's it's used for disruption by others or how others try to disrupt this so, so to really look at the at the big picture and and there I hope that this uh, branding perspective can can be of, of inspiration for others as well perfect um i'm very interested to know about your personal reflections of this study so how you personally interpret uh, your study in this in this conclusion these reflections but before that i will use you know my my role as as moderator here because i would like to ask you uh, two questions so how can we truly balance a branding so this branding that you're studying now with uh, real politic you know that you refer in the study and also and you mentioned this a bit, how, what are some potential domestic impacts of these branding strategies? So if you could address these two questions and then tell me your personal reflections of this study. Mm. So about the first question with the balance between um, politics and, and branding, I mean, I think the most important point is that there needs to be a balance. Um, mm. um, and it, it like these two things they should ideally be aligned um and and when i look at, at these yeah smaller countries like sweden i mean the politics that you do why not talk about it why not why not use it as as a way to to stand out um and so the, the this these two things are very interrelated i think and and also if if you have gained more recognition it might be easier to pursue your policies i mean that's the whole point of this branding but also um the, the branding should of course not not you know overweigh because you cannot brand something that's not there um it, it shouldn't become an empty signifier so so um, I think the way to balance it is, is is to always make sure um first of all that that these two uh, kind of different realms but that are anyways interconnected that they that they go in the same direction that they work together and that they support each other um for um your second question about how domestic uh, publics might be um impacted by this i i see it as uh, there's two <laughs> most extreme uh um you know uh sides of of it could go in two extreme ways and there's of course a, a big a gray zone in between um worst case scenario especially with with this feminist foreign policy when i think about it is that 
um, people who become aware of it uh, might not support it. They might not feel uh, represented by it. They might not be able to identify with it because it's not what they stand for. And then um, this can really um, lead to, to, to a big discrepancy and, and also create some attack surface if the maybe call it reality at home doesn't fit with the image that a country tries to promote. And then you lose credibility as a state. Best case scenario, um, people really are very inspired by it. They, they feel that this is what represents who, who we are as a country. Um, they might feel pride. They, yeah, they, they feel really that they can be part of this. And, and also maybe it might inspire people at home to really make sure that they um, hold up to, to the standards that a country sets for itself. And then, you know, I think probably you will have both things and a lot of in between. Uh, but so to illustrate um, what my, my thoughts on this. Um, and then for your third question about um, the personal reflections that I had, um, I mean, I've, I've seen this also in my previous research, but um, what, what kind of, again, um, really intrigued me is that, of course, politics and, and communication, as I mentioned before, it's, it's according to different logics, but it, it works together very closely. And the, the politics, in this case, this feminist foreign policy, I mean, it, it really wants to make a point, it wants to disrupt, it wants to make a claim while, while the communication is more about appealing to people about building relations so somehow there there is this tension and um, which also is reflected in these these three ways that that i see sweden legitimates its policy on the one hand embracing this activist uh, element on the other hand really trying to fit into to a bigger um bigger debate that's already there but somehow it still works out and i think it is because it it's still under this overarching umbrella of promoting human rights and um i i i find that very interesting i yeah so so that has has actually just uh, showed me that probably we need more research about it, you know phenomena like these Mm -hmm. no, it's perfect. This is well. This reflection part is actually one of the greatest cores and pillars of the conversation. So, I think it was very good. And to close uh, all these reflections, if you had to all this discussion, if you had to sum it up in no more than two sentences, so a punchline for our audience to remember about this whole talk, what would it be? So I would want uh, the audience and, and the viewers, and also myself, to be honest, uh, to remember that it's important to dare to also perhaps critically interrogate something you already know, something you believe in from a new perspective, because that's how we learn and that's how we um, find out new things about the world. Perfect, Isabel, thank you very much. Thank you. So for all of those who are watching this on YouTube, in the description of the video, you can find all the resources, all the materials, the, uh, the study that Isabel and I were just chatting about, and uh, also the link to our Let's Talk About Media and Communication website. This episode is not only available on video, you can find us um, whatever you get your podcasts, and you have a newsletter if you want to subscribe and uh, stay in touch with the latest episodes.